outside of the Wallace Collection when he visited in 1878. Um, it's an exceptional collection. It was assembled by four generations of Marquises of Hartford and Richard Wallace. It's renowned for its 17th century Dutch and Flemish paintings and some of the finest old master paintings. It also boasts an outstanding array of Sev porcelain, European and Oriental arms and armour and exquisitely worked small-scale medieval and Renaissance objects in a range of materials like boxwood, Italian maiolica, Limoges painted enamel and rock crystal to name but a few. But it is the Wallace's superb collection of 18th century French art and furniture, which is probably its most distinctive feature. Now, the Hartfords, the Marquises of Hartford, were Francophiles. They were long standing Francophiles. They served as ambassadors to France in the early 18th century, where they mingled with French royalty and became connoisseur collectors of art. But it was the fourth Marquis uh, who made the most significant contribution to the collection. He collected on an enormous scale between 1843 and 1870, the year of his death, setting the tone for the collection as we know it today. Um, more than 90% of the 5,500 works of art that we have here in the Wallace Collection were acquired during his lifetime. And he was widely acknowledged to be the uh, greatest collector in Paris, if not Europe, long before his death. Now, after his death, his son, Richard Wallace, um, continued to build the collection, um, greatly extending its chronological range with his uh, purchases of medieval and Renaissance works of art. Now, Richard Wallace, from whom the collection takes its name, was a remarkable man. He was a great philanthrope and a discerning collector like his father. And he was responsible for safeguarding the family's art collection when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in France in 1875, bringing it across and safely installing it here in Hartford House. Uh, and, uh, but it was his widow, Lady Wallace, who bequeathed the entire collection to the nation in uh, 1897, some years after her husband's death, but no doubt in keeping with his wishes given his record for philanthropy and largesse. And on the 25th of June, um, the doors of Hartford House in 1900 were flung open to the public when uh, the Wallace Collection became a public gallery. Now we're standing in the Great Gallery, and this was built on top of the stables of Hartford House by Richard Wallace. When he brought the art collection across, there wasn't enough room in the house to accommodate the old master paintings, and he wanted them all to be congregated in one single space. So he built this great space, which is magnificent, over the stables of Hartford House uh, to accommodate, as I say, specifically the family's collection of old master paintings. And indeed, to this day, it remains unrivaled. We have Rubens, Rembrandt, Titians, Murillo's, uh, Claude Lorraine, Velasquez, you know, to name but a few. But and, and certainly when Charles Frick visited the Wallace Collection, he was inspired to create his own museum in New York City, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of, but Frick. Um, so there's one painting here, which is not an old master painting. So I'm gonna test you on your art history knowledge. Can, it's in this side, it's this side. Can you guess which painting here is not an old master painting? Doesn't matter if you get it wrong. It's it's it. Yes, it is. You were right, madam, and so were you. Um, it is, of course, this portrait of George IV by the celebrated British uh, artist and royal academician, Sir Thomas Lawrence. Now, the reason why it's hanging here and not anywhere else is because no other room in Hartford House can accommodate such a large painting. But it's also rather fitting that it's here because George IV was a great friend of the fourth, uh, fourth Marquis, the third Marquis, I beg your pardon. Uh, and they shared similar tastes in art. So, that's why there are such close parallels with the Royal Collection. Um, if you were to go to the Royal Collection now, you would almost certainly experience a sense of déjà vu because you will come across similar table bronzes like the ones you see over there, serve porcelain and Dutch and Flemish paintings, all mirroring what we have here. So that was a bit of a potted history of how the Wallace Collection came about. I'm now going to focus on three paintings in the Great Gallery. Uh, masterpieces by European masters, uh, beginning with this um, fantastic portrait by the great Spanish 17th century artist, Diego Velasquez. Here you see, you need to have a good view of 
because we're going to focus on this lady. It's entitled Lady with a Fan, uh, and it's probably one of Velasquez's most famous and intriguing portraits. Uh, it's a mysterious composition in many ways, not least because the identity of the sitter is uh, to this day still unknown. Um, speculation about who she might be include the artist's wife or daughter, but recently such seems to suggest she's not actually Spanish, but a French lady, the Duchess of Chagres, uh, who had fled to Spain in exile. As you, can say, as you can see, it's entitled The Lady with a Fan. And she's very smartly attired. She's wearing immaculate white kid gloves and she's carrying an elaborate open fan. But her, her gaze is very solemn, is it not? You know, and with the um, prominent rosary, can you see, and bow and pendant, uh, it suggests an air of almost religious intensity. But then, and then you've got the dark, sober colours of her dress and head covering. But don't you think it contrasts or it's at odds with the uh, rather low-cut neckline? So it is a bit uh, strange. Um, Velasquez uses a limited palette of black, grey and or white and brown, but he manages to enliven the composition at the bottom of the painting with a flash of blue and red in the ribbon surrounding the silver watch case. Now, Velasquez was a skilled portraitist. He was born in Seville uh, in 1599. In 1610, he studied under the artist Francisco Pacheco, whose daughter Juana he ended up marrying. Um, his early works were typically religious in subject matter, um, but he also painted scenes from everyday life, known in Spain as boligones. But you know, it was his ability to capture the sitter's personality and character uh, that singled Velasquez out as a prodigious talent from an early age, and this can be seen in some of his earliest works. Um, in 1623, he was appointed court painter uh, to Philip IV, and uh, over the next 40 years, he painted countless portraits of members of the Spanish royal household. You might be familiar with Las Maninas, it's a case in point. Uh, he was the only artist allowed to paint the king, uh, and um, he produced a series of iconic images of the king. The king's first minister, Olivares, declared that before Velasquez, no one had painted the real king. Uh, poems were written praising Velasquez for his ability to capture the king's spiritual qualities as well as his personal appearance. It made, when I was researching this, it made me want to look at a portrait of Philip IV to see what these so-called spiritual qualities were all about. But anyway, um, now the ritual of portrait painting in the 17th century was such that, particularly in relation to clothing and accessories, every detail carried a particular significance. So every gesture, every accessory would contribute to the meaning of the whole in a very complex relationship between the artist and the sitter and the effect that they wish to achieve. And with that in mind, we can see that this lady is not wearing the typical Spanish dress from that period. The painting has been dated to the late 1630s and um, a period when Velasquez was at his most prolific but no respectable Spanish lady would have allowed herself to have been depicted with such a uh, you know, plunging neckline. And then, if we're doing a bit of detective work to see if it is indeed this French lady, um, we, we, we will note that you know, the lace cuffs, the rosary, the ribbons, uh, and they're all items of high French fashion. And then, of course, the, 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 the fan that she's carrying is typical French gold pique work and tortoise shell. Also, French ladies at that time used to wear dark head coverings to complement their pale skin, so it was a kind of fashionable um, feature. And finally, this, this brown farthingale skirt that she wears, it was worn by, although it originated in uh, France, it was worn by Spanish ladies at that time and later. So overall, what we have here is a mixture of French and Spanish fashionable couture, but with a strong love towards France. Now, we know from a contemporary document that in 1639, Velasquez was painting, sorry, 1638, early 1638, he was painting the portrait of a prominent French aristocrat, a woman called Marie de Rohan, the Duchess of Chabreuse. 
Uh, she, had, she was the lady in waiting to the Spanish born Queen of France, Anne. She had to flee France because she'd fallen out of favour with Cardinal Richelieu, having been implicated in a plot against him. And so she fled overnight on horseback, disguised as a man, accompanied by two grooms across the Pyrenees. It was the worst time to be seeking asylum in Spain because both countries were at war. Um, but she managed to get it, and she remained in Spain until she went to England for the last two years of her exile, returning to France after Richelieu had died. I think you might find this anecdote that I'm going to tell you rather amusing, whether or not it is this uh, French lady or not, but a year after this portrait was painted, uh, a royal decree was issued in Spain banning uh, low-cut necklines, uh, except for licensed prostitutes. So, I think that this painting must have caused a stir, uh, if nothing else, on a sartorial level. Now, the painting uh, first uh, cropped up or appeared in the collection of Leopold Bonaparte, the estranged brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. Eventually, it found its way into the collection of Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, and he was persuaded to sell the painting to the fourth Marquis for 15,000 francs in 18... Um, 47, because his wife did not like the look of the sitter. So I want to ask you, as we finish talking about this painting, I want to ask you, I, I can't say I disagree with the, the wife, to be honest, that's my personal view. She looks very sad, doesn't she? Or are you intrigued by her? I just don't like the eyes. What's to me, the eyes look like Maggie Smith eyes. Yeah, yeah. It's like really these like, sad, I don't want to be melancholic eyes. Eyes, but they're like bullfrog no? eyes, aren't they? Yeah. She just looks so doleful. Um, maybe because she was in exile, maybe because she was a French woman amongst Spanish people. I don't know, but she looks. I'm not surprised that uh, Rothschild's wife wanted uh, her not to grace their walls because it's not very cheerful, but it's one of his best portraits. Uh, do you have a view on it? Do you think it's. Uh, Skillfully uh, executed, or do you have any view on it? It's certainly skillful, of course. Yeah. The detail is immaculate. Yeah, the, the detail is immaculate. Mm -hmm. Yes, but do you, do you find the colours a bit sombre? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's almost as if she's in mourning. Yes, uh -huh. yes, absolutely. And then with the rosary as well. You know. Okay, we'll move on to the next painting, which is really cheerful. <laughs> Spot on. It's, it is Canaletto. You know, you can recognise the Canaletto anywhere today, can't you? There's another Venetian painter, I think his name is uh, Guardi, no, Guardi, who paints panoramic views of Venice. Uh, and his style is quite distinctive, but Canaletto's is very distinctive. So, Canaletto, uh, this is a view, is one of two views, it's one of a pair of the harbour, big views of the harbour of San Marco, painted from opposing vantage points. The other one of the pair is next to the lady with a fan. So at the end of the tour, in a couple, few minutes, you can go and have a look at it if you wanted to compare it. But um, as I said, it's, it's of the view of the harbour of San Marco. Um, Canaletto, um, his real name was uh, Giovanni Antonio Canal. Um, his nickname derived from his father's name, which was Canal. Specialised in painting vedute, which is the Italian word for views or view painting. I think it's fair to say that Canaletto has immortalised Venice in paint. Um, he was born in 1699, 1697, I beg your pardon. Uh, his father was in Venice. His father was a theatrical scene painter and he received his earliest training from his father. And um, he developed very quickly as an artist. He was very talented, and certainly by the mid-1720s, he um, 
had established himself as a leading artist in Venice, um, and he was sought after by Venetian patrons and um, art collectors who passed through Venice. Um, but what you're going to find really surprising and ironic about Canaletto's approach, his artistic approach, is that these panoramic views of his of Venice were very rarely accurate representations of the scene. He would deliberately distort, I mean, it was a bit of a cheat, actually. He would distort the perspective, manipulate it to make the view more attractive. So, for example, he would make slight alterations to the proportions of the buildings, mm. and in some cases, even their location. So, um, to make the, the picture sort of picture perfect. And all this was done to enhance the appeal of Venice as an exciting cosmopolitan city to draw in the visitors. And indeed, it proved to be an extremely successful form of early advertising because Venice swiftly became a favorite destination of those on the Grand Tour, part of the Grand Tour. And Canaletto's studio in particular, an important stop for those tourists seeking souvenirs of his big views of Venice. Now, I don't know if any of you, I'm sure you have been to Venice. Have you, some of you, all of you? Um, this view is, of the, the view, the painting offers us a view from the steps of the church of San Giorgio Maggiore. Uh, so you've got the opening of the Grand Canal in the middle, you've got the island of Giudecca on the right, and the Doge's Palace with the Campanini on the left. Or the other way around. Um, you also have a clear view of the Church of Santa Maria della Salute, but the reality is that this composition is actually a clever composite of three viewpoints, not from the steps of the church but from the courtyard, and it includes a number of bell towers that simply can't be seen from that viewing point. So you can always test it out and go, and you know, take a photograph of it now and go to Venice and, and test it out because it's not, it's not the way it is. To, topographically speaking, it's not like that. And that um, Canaletto has also you know, chosen to um, include some figures on the waterfront to give us a sense of daily life in Venice as her cittadini and citizens go about their business. So you can see there's a beggar here, there's even a monkey. You've got two merchants conversing, one's wearing a fez and the other a turban, again reinforcing this image of Venice as an exotic trading center with a rich maritime history. Then you've got a lawyer conversing, a judge conversing with uh, a, a, a man of cloth, the clergyman, the priest. Um, and then the lagoon is dotted with sea vessels. You've got uh, the, including the gondola, the traditional Venetian flat-bottomed rowing boat with its distinctive iron prow. Can you see? The, the S shape of the prow uh, refers to the bends in the Grand Canal, which I think is really rather poetic, isn't it? And the six teeth sticking out refer or represent the six districts in Venice, the Sestieri. And can you guess what this tooth that sticks out at the back is meant to represent? Gondola. I'm sorry? Gondola. No, it's meant to represent the island of Judeca, okay. which is separate from the, the mm. whole of Venice. It's, it's very, it's lovely the way the whole identity of Venice is even caught up in its uh, you know, accoutrements. And then in the middle, this, this, this is an early version of the Vaporetto, you know, the passenger boat. It's a bacchiello, and it's being towed. So um, the whole, it's a beautiful uh, composition. It's a serene balance of sky, water, and land bathed in that wonderful Venetian light. If you've been to Venice, you'll know what I mean. Now, Canaletto's idealized uh, big views of Venice were, albeit formulaic, they were very formulaic, they were hugely popular in the 18th century. Anyone who's anyone who had money wanted a Canaletto. Uh, and I'm sure you'll agree this particular painting is no exception. Do you like it? Yes. Have you been to Venice? It gives you a sense of comfort, doesn't it? Because Venice hasn't really changed. It's such, a, it's such an old city. It's, it's almost as if it's preserved an aspect. You know what I mean? But, but actually, the, the, the positionings of those buildings are not totally accurate. So that's, but we can forgive him because it's a nice painting. So now the last painting I'm going to talk to you about uh, in the Great Gallery is one that needs no introduction. You may already recognize it. Uh, 
it's um, possibly the Wallace Collection's most famous painting, and certainly it's Franz Hauser's most celebrated work, The Artist. Uh, it is uh, an iconic masterpiece that has been referred to as the Dutch Mona Lisa. Uh, it depicts an exuberant and flamboyantly dressed man whose gaze, uh, he fixes us with a gaze that seems to follow us around the room. It, it's good. He's got very magnetic eyes, I would say. Um, his costume is quite elaborate, and this is quite an important feature, which I'll talk about a little later. But uh, you should know that this level of ornamentation on a costume was rare for the period. Um, so, House has painted him, uh, he's got a very engaging pose, hasn't he? Um, he doesn't look like he's stiff or uh, too formal. It's very engaging, and House has painted him as if he's uh, almost looking down on us, you know? Um, now, portrait sitters were very rarely painted smiling until, it's entitled The Laughing Cavalier, by the way. Um, portrait sitters were very rarely painted smiling until the late 18th century. Okay, he's not laughing, but he is definitely smiling. Um, and House breaks with tradition again by presenting him very informally. So he's situated or located very near the foreground, um, in close proximity to us, the viewer, you know, he's standing and looking at us sideways with his hand thrust confidently on his hip, his left arm akimbo, as it were, with the elbow kind of breaking through the pictorial space. This was a, a, a device that was frequently employed by Howes to engage the viewer. You almost feel he's in the room with you, don't you? Um, and then, you know, he's... Uh, so this kind of wonderful combination of heightened foreshortening, um, swagger pose and low viewpoint gives the sitter a wonderful spontaneity. And then you add to that what he's wearing, his black, broad-brimmed, upturned hat, his jaunty moustache, his pink cheeks, his rosy lips, uh, and organ curls, they all powerfully add to the dynamic quality of the picture. It's a superb portrait. Um, but there's a certain amount of mystery surrounding this portrait. I wouldn't be talking to you about it otherwise. We don't know who he is. Uh, we don't even know who commissioned it. We don't know uh, whether he was indeed a cavalier. Uh, the title, the laughing cat. I mean, he's and he's not even laughing, is he? He's sort of smirking, maybe. It's like he's got some delicious secret that he won't share with us. Um, but you know. We just don't know very much about him uh, other than, and the, the, the title The Laughing Cavalier was given to this painting in 1888 um, when the painting was loaned to the Royal Academy by Richard Wallace for an exhibition, and that catchy title has stuck ever since. But we do know a couple of things. We do know that he was 26 years old when, he doesn't look 26, does he? Mm -hmm. He looks like he's in his mid 30s, but he's got very good color and very good skin. Uh, he was 26 years old, and the painting was uh, painted in 1624. The reason we know that is those two items of information can be gleaned from the Latin inscription at the top right-hand corner of the portrait. This was a common feature in most portraits uh, at that time. But again, his identity is not disclosed. Uh, there was speculation that he was military because uh, possibly a member of one of the civic militia companies that was stationed in Harlem. So this group portrait's house painted, and of course, you can see the shiny gold pommel here. It's, you can see he's got a rapier tucked into the crook of his left arm. And again, that could point to a military background. But, you know, he could just as well have been, uh, you know, a, a wealthy man of commerce, given this lavish outfit. You know, his richly embroidered silk doublet with the starch, lace, collar, and cuffs are expensive, out of French... Uh, fashionable menswear, um, young, affluent, uh, urban, often unmarried Dutch men would look to the French court for inspiration. Um, recently a theory was put forward that this is a portrait of somebody called Tielemann Wusterman, a wealthy cloth merchant from Harlem, because uh, House has painted an, a portrait of his, sort of, I guess, ten years after this was painted, and there is a striking resemblance, but we can't be definitive about this. Now, something you will find very interesting uh, about the costume are these slashed doublet sleeves. Can you see? Revealing the 
uh, undergarment worn by the uh, Zeta. And uh, this slash doublet look became really fashionable in the 17th century when uh, men returning from the Dutch Wars of Independence often wore clothes that were ripped and torn. And that style became associated with the concept of valor. So even if you hadn't gone to war, you could go home and rip your clothes and you would be deemed courageous and valorous. Um, last point about the costume is that, um, stylistically speaking, these slashes uh, produce a visual effect that's very pleasing because they reveal the white linen shirt below and then together with the rough and cuffs, they create a wonderful rhythm of white across the picture. Um, also, uh, you know, his treatment of the lace cuffs is, is extraordinary. He's managed to translate the, the very uh, intricate geometric design of the lace onto paint, onto the finished costume. And you can see the costume peeping through uh, the lace. And you know, I think he's chosen to uh, showcase the cuffs, give them prominence by placing them in the center, in the foreground, and so he's showcasing these sumptuous cuffs. I think the portrait also shows us the variety of, of ways in which uh, Hals can paint, how gifted he was from the quick upturn strokes of the cuffs down to the um, minute handling and intricate details of the lace. When we come to consider the purpose of this portrait, there are a number of clues in the portrait that uh, can help shed light on this. If you remember, I said at the beginning that uh, this, you know, the complex iconography in the embroidery was unusual and rare, uh, but there are a series of emblems that have been embroidered onto the doublet sleeve whose visual language would have been understood by the learned elite, right? So we can see that, you know, parts and ad pointing to this being an engagement portrait. Because if you remember, we don't know who commissioned it, why it was commissioned, we don't even know who he is. But we can maybe guess that it's an engagement portrait because of what's on the sleeve. There are hearts and arrows, there are flaming torches and horns of cornucopia, symbolizing fecundity and fruitfulness. Then there are bees and um, everlasting knots, all of which were symbols of love and romance, its stings and barbs but they were also symbols of fortune, virtue, and strength. So this portrait was acquired by the fourth Marquis. Remember I said the fourth Marquis was the one who made the, most, the greatest contribution to the collection. He acquired this in 1865 when he outbid the Baron James de Rothschild at more than six times the sale price at auction. He wanted this painting so badly, and I think he was right more than six times. And that fierce competitive bidding war helped to restore House's reputation, which was a bit flagging at that point. Uh, you know, restore his reputation as being one of the most gifted portrait painters of his generation, and certainly helped to locate him as a leading artist from the dark world. He's, um, he's a very famous painter. You know, lots of people, even before I started guiding here, had heard of the Laughing Cavalier. I must confess, I hadn't. I had to research him for the tours because we were told, whatever tours you do, you must include the Laughing Cavalier. He's our, you know, the star of our show, the star of our museum. What do you think? Do you, do you find him? You like him. Do you all like him? Yeah. You know, he's a man's man, but he's also a girl's man. You know, he's, a, <laughs> he's got that cheeky look. He's certainly a player, isn't he? And he's a guy that you could go to the pub with if you were a guy and have a good laugh. Snobbish. Yeah, he's snobbish, but I think he knows it. And I think he's very modern as well. He doesn't look like an old-fashioned person. He looks like someone, you know, you meet now wearing a leather jacket, say, not this example. <laughs> so anyway, that concludes the tour. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.